本是释迦牟尼佛，南无本师释迦牟尼佛，南无本师释迦牟尼佛。So now we are discussing these uh, five kinds of acquaintances we need in order to make these uh, six steps of uh, meditation on the breath, uh, wonderful methods. Wonderful methods means the methods of liberation. And uh, as we see from this text, actually, these uh, methods you can use according to your convenience. It does not mean the, that uh, during the counting you cannot uh, know clearly the uh, long breath and the short breath. Hmm? and uh, knowing with wisdom also their causes you cannot uh, experience the whole body hmm? and you cannot uh, sublimate the uh, bodily formations uh, the uh, actually uh, the breath bodily formations mean the breath we have explained. So you can actually uh, experience something of these uh, four exercises connected with the uh, mindfulness gone into the body while counting. You cannot strictly separate uh, these uh, exercises. We can understand them as a whole, as a process. And uh, we have also uh, mentioned that you can, as opposed to the thousand tradition, you, in this process, you can not only pay attention to the in-breath and out-breath, but you can also pay attention to the, what is called, in-between breath. And uh, when the in-between breath is long, the gross breath will naturally become short. And this is a way how you go into samadhi. When the in-between breath becomes longer and uh, obvious. The gross breath in the nose, which goes to the body through the nose, becomes less and less clear until it finally disappears. This is how uh, you can get also samadhi. Why not? when you consciously go through all the stages of disappearance of the breath and the breath becoming more and more subtle, you can get samadhi and uh, you will detach from the uh, sensations. You experience the joy, but you detach from the joy. So the uh, uh, detachment from the joy leads actually to experiencing the supreme appeasement. And in the supreme appeasement, the uh, breath becomes, so to say, not noticeable anymore. The gross breath, but the subtle breath is still there. Uh, now we are 
also learning Qigong, so uh, we can use this uh, knowledge of the subtle breath to experience the subtle breath in different energy places in the body or in the whole body according to the need. Hmm? Then in this tradition, that means in the Tian Tai tradition, then you can actually connect hmm, these different channels and uh, study the uh, vital energies in a very subtle way. This part is naturally missing in the Southern tradition, which pays attention only to the uh, what here is called the gross breath. Gross breath, as we have learned, is based on the gross space. Hmm? The subtle breath is based on the subtle space everywhere in the body. Now, we have also learned that uh, in this tradition you can change your attention according to the need. When the mind has a tendency to sing, you need to uh, investigate the object. And for that, the best is to differentiate the object clearly. Hmm? And for that, you can use the vipassana attention. Vipassana means uh, wisdom of differentiation. And wisdom of differentiation means wisdom of differentiations of many objects. While the shamatha is concerned with non-differentiated object. Non-differentiated object is one object. So the objects of vipassana are many. Hmm? The object of shamatha is one image. Now, in vipassana, you, in order to study vipassana, this is very important. You have to know the objects of wisdom. This is in a thousand tradition. It is called the sorrow knowledge. First, uh, vipassana knowledge is the uh, or the first step in vipassana is the knowledge of the uh, objects of wisdom. And the ob in the ob objects of wisdom, you don't find any self. Buddhism is the science of non-self. So, in order to realize Buddhism, you have to contemplate your experience as the experience of non-self. And for that you introduce uh, this starting, the first, acquaintance with the five aggregates. When you see the five aggregates, you cannot find the self. When you see the self, you cannot find the five aggregates. Because the aggregates means uh, many things together. And through knowledge of the aggregates, as we see, uh, we become acquainted with the dependent origination. Dependent origination means dependence does not allow the idea of eternity. And origination does not allow the idea of uh, uh, annihilation. So dependent origina realizing dependent origination means attuning to the middle way.
and then the object of realization is the Four Noble Truths. They all come here. It is through the penetration of the Four Noble Truths that the disciple of the Buddha becomes enlightened. Normally, we cannot see the Four Noble Truths. When we see suffering, we do not see the end of suffering. When we see the cause of suffering, we do not see uh, uh, the middle way. We cannot see normally the Four Noble Truths together. We cannot contemplate them together. In order to contemplate them together, we have to have an object which we cannot grasp. If we have an object that we can grasp, we cannot see suffering and annihilation of suffering at the same time. Impossible. Now, uh, we also want to understand the uh, practice of the bodhisattvas, which is, of course, we should not separate it from the practice of the disciples. The Buddha is also an arahat, and he is a teacher of all the arahats. But we should definitely understand that the object of the path of the Bodhisattva is the one object, non-dual object. And this object may you may call emptiness, you may call suchness. Hmm? And that is the object of the realization of the Bodhisattva. And he realizes it by the practice of the paramis, hmm? starting with the parami of the transcendental wisdom. Hmm? Transcendental wisdom means wisdom beyond differentiation. Hmm? Now, According to this uh, tradition, especially explained in Tienta, you can also practice this wisdom on the base of meditation on the breath. But here we have the practice of the meditation on the breath in the frame of the practice of the disciple. So it is also explained as the practice of the disciples. But we have explained already in regard to shamatha, always uh, somehow this uh, idea of the non-dual nature is in the background. The idea of uh, the ultimate realization the idea of actually the non-differentiation. So, uh, we have, we don't need to go in uh, detail into the practice of counting. You can go through the text yourself. Hmm? And uh, we now start to learn the uh, acquaintance of the aggregates. Hmm? So when you pay attention to the aggregates, you pay, you pay attention to 
the many, many objects. And you pay attention to many objects, again, on the base of the breast. So let us see how they, the text explain it. Now, if you practice the five aggregates, what do you do? You regard the breath as the rupa, as the form. Hmm? And the definition of the form is actually in Abhidhamma being scattered. Hmm? The form is that which you can scatter. And actually, when you uh, study the breath with the differentiating wisdom, it will scatter. You will discover in it the different qualities of the four elements. All forms are composed of the four elements. Hmm? So you will discover there the quality of hardness, softness, hmm? smoothness, roughness, flowing, cohesion, hmm? heat, coolness, pushing, supporting. All these qualities are in the process of the change. But now, when you pay attention to the differentiated object, then the mind also will sharpen up. Uh, the real vipassana is also a state of samadhi. Through the samadhi of vipassana, uh, you can also realize the uh, ultimate reality. Hmm? There is a verse in the Dhammapada saying, yatha yatha vipasati khandanam udaya bhayam labhati piti pamojam amatam tam vijananto. Hmm? When one uh, differentiates with wisdom the arising and passing away of the uh, aggregates, the five aggregates, one experiences the joy, uh, gladness and joy, uh, while uh, uh, knowing the that beyond the death. What is that beyond the death? Nirvana. So, by inv investigation can become also the uh, Miao Men, the wonderful method. The method of realization. And it cannot be strictly separated from counting, following, hmm? placing. So uh, we have to see this process of uh, awakening as an organic process, not as something we separate and learn one independently of the other. This kind of view is called what we have described as a mechanical thinking. Hmm? And the mechanical thinking precisely is what divides us from reality, what separates us from reality. Because we have the automatic or mechanical thinking, therefore we do not, do not see the whole. 
but the reality is a whole. It cannot be otherwise because it is dependent origination. So in a way, the view of dependent origination implies the non-dual view. But in the northern tradition, it is especially emphasized. It is especially emphasized because of the emphasis of one reality being the emptiness. But in Theravada, as opposed to some other Buddhist tradition, the dependent origination is also described as emptiness. It is clearly explained even in the Visuddhimagga itself, which is like the uh, most orthodox Theravada Mahavihara view. Yet, the conclusion is not that uh, that which is samsara cannot be different from nirvana, that which is nirvana cannot be different from samsara. It does not lead to this conclusion. But this conclusion, in a way, is logical hmm? because nirvana is always there. Therefore, to understand the uh, path of the Bodhisattva, we have to study the Transcendental Wisdom Sutra. The main idea of the Transcendental Wisdom Sutras is that the Nirvana is a natural state. In fact, all the practices you will find in Northern Buddhism are related to this basic idea. So by devoting oneself to that practice, cultivating it uh, time and again with continuity, physical appliances and mental appliances uh, arise. So this is why we have quoted this verse, huh? where only when you have a mental and physical appliance, it's translated the Prashrabdi, Ching huh? An, lightness and peace, or relaxation and uh, I like to translate it as relaxation and clarity <laughs> everybody has a different <laughs> way uh, anyway uh, when it arises you can join the shamatha and vipassana together in this tradition it is very important to understand then you can turn your uh, object of investigation to the mind and uh, in this tradition the mind is the base of everything it is a base for uh, shamatha it is a base for vipassana all objects come from mind But the ideal state for investigation of the mind is when the so-called uh, eight apalakshas, the eight uh, things that make the samadhi not perfect, disappear. And that you can make on the meditation on the breath. What are they? The applied thought, the sustained thought, the happiness uh, the joy, happiness hmm? then uh, uh, the uh, suffering and uh, unpleasant uh, mental 
unpleasant mental sensation, huh? yo or uh, domanasa, huh? how to translate domanasa? <laughs> what is the best translation for domanasa? Sadness? Hmm? Actually, it means literally the bad mind. Hmm? And uh, finally, also in breast and out breast, when these uh, are not there anymore the mind attain the perfect balance. Hmm? Normally it happens in the fourth dhyana, but actually now you are studying this tradition, so uh, especially we are emphasizing the nine hmm, stages of shamatha. When you have applied when you stay in the ninth stage of uh, uh, samatha, you can also attain this state without actually going through these dhyanas, because when you go through the dhyanas, your mind becomes stuck. You cannot... You are absorbed in the object. So in a way you are stuck, unless you have the supernatural powers. The Buddha has, so the tradition realized the, uh, his attainment through the use of the supernatural powers, namely the supernatural power of uh, the knowledge of the past lives and the supernatural power of the divine eye which can see how we beings are reborn in accordance with our karma. Hmm? So this led to his penetration of the dependent origination. According to the tradition, all Buddhist tradition, in the first watch of the night of enlightenment, Buddha contemplates the dependent origination hmm? with the help of this divine eye and uh, the Pube Nivasa, huh? how to say, the knowledge of the past lives. So he gets the whole scope of the dependent origination and uh, he attains a perfect clarity. According to the northern tradition, hmm, the Huayan, he, uh, uh, or even in you have the same idea in the old Buddhist traditions, he thinks that this perfect clarity, hmm, this experience, we beings are unable to understand hmm? this uh, depths of dependent origination of the middle path we are unable to understand then the Brahma convinces him and this depths of dependent origination is the perfect uh, interflowing hmm, of uh, the all phenomena. Which then has the universe dimension. So, in a simply saying, this engaging in the aggregates again uh, leads to the, even so you di investigate a differentiated object, it leads again to the pliancy hmm, which you need.
to join the shamatha and vipassana together. Hmm? When you join the shamatha and vipassana together, you can get realization. Uh, this is explained as uh, in the Dhammapada, nati jhanam apanyasa nati panya ajana sa yasa panya cha jhanam cha so nibbana sa santike. One who has both the wisdom and the uh, shamatha, the uh, dhyana, then he is in the vicinity of nirvana. Hmm? And for that, one has to contemplate the ultimate object. In this tradition, the ultimate object is a mind indeed. One who has thoroughly trained the body like that engages with the aggregates by attending to objective and subjective phenomena. I have to see the Chinese to be clear. Anybody has found him? Ah, Yin. Hmm? Ah, here, here. So, there is no objective, um, uh, so she can sanctify, okay. I understand. It's a bit uh, strange uh, translation. It's a bit confusing. Swachik and Nengchi means grahaka grahya huh? in Sanskrit. means uh, the uh, object and subject. Huh? It would be better huh? uh, than attending to objective and subjective phenomena. Of course, uh, this translation is right because the object and subject is many, many objects and many, many subjects, but uh, it is not so clear. Hmm? He translates this concept of the uh, one who can, that which uh, grasps the phenomena and the, the that which grasps and that what is grasped. Hmm? The Chinese translation is very precise. In other words, the subject and object. But of course, we are talking of Buddhism, so there is no real subject and no real object, because the subject is many, many things together. 
and the object also. And the object is, of course, the form. We have already said that actually the wind is um, many, many things together. The wind can never come without earth, without water, without fire. Hmm? And all these, they have many, many qualities. And they are being moved, transported by the wind. If there is no wind, the hardness cannot move. Hmm? And everything is on the move. So, simply saying, when he meditates, he pays attention to the object, which is a breath, and which is the form, which is the aggregate of the form, hmm, based on the body, which is also the aggregate of the form. Hmm. The breath is the aggregate of the form, but we have said it is uh, in uh, the Theravada tradition, the aggregate of the form uh, born of the mind. Hmm? Chitta Jarupa. And it is dependent, the Chitta Jarupa is dependent on the Karaja Rupa, on the uh, form born of the karma. Hmm? If there is no form born of the karma, there cannot be breath. And when you meditate on the four elements, what will happen? The form will scatter. The nature of the form is scattering. The form will scatter into what? Into kalapas, hmm? into the uh, uh, the uh, you can say the molecules or into the aggregates of form. Hmm? So. The form is actually very, understanding of the form is actually very, very important in this tradition. Actually, the form arises and ceases in the same place. Hmm? It's, you will find in Theravada also the same principle. Hmm? Yatha, yatha, upajati, tatha, tatha, nirujati. Hmm? The form, that's why we have explained the real object of meditation on the breath is the, uh, our, is the concept of the breath. Hmm? The real breath is, is appearing and disappearing in each and every moment. So what we actually experience is the concept of the breath. That's why we can contemplate the breath being long and breath being short. How can the breath be long and short? It disappears in each and every moment. It is a concept of the breath that is long or short. And that concept we follow. Therefore, we can get samadhi. We cannot follow the real breath because it disappears in the very moment it appears. And this is actually the nature of reality. Whatever we hold is not the reality but our 
image of the reality. It becomes very logical. The money we hold to, the woman we hold to, the car we hold to, the house we hold to, all these objects of our attachment, they are the images, not the reality. The reality are is the five aggregates. And when you, in the five aggregates, when you analyze, in the form you analyze the five aggregates, they will scatter. And scattering is the nature of the form. So this is very deep, but when we understand it, the emptiness becomes clear. In this tradition, the realization of emptiness, the first step is to uh, uh, see the uh, emptiness of the form, the scattering nature of the form. in the form is not real, the mind which hangs on the form is, cannot be real also. Hmm? So that's how you dissolve the subject and the object. So you get in this way to the non-dual experience, which is the nature of the mind. So when he engages with the aggregate of the form, the form will actually scatter. Hmm? Now, that which uh, receive the form, that is called sensation. Hmm? Now, sensation cannot exist without the form. Very important to understand. Because the sensation is a reception of the form. Now, is the form or object different from the sensation? Is it the same as sensation? This is the observation of the aggregates. You go to the dependent origination, neither same nor different. There is no sensation without the form, there is no form without the sensation. Hmm? But still, you have to understand the form and sensation are not the same. This is the first vipassana knowledge in the Theravada tradition. Hmm? Nama Rupa Paricheda. But yet, they exist only in dependence on each other. They cannot exist separately. So actually, ultimately, the real answer to the question is a form and sensation same or different is neither same nor different but at first we have to realize their difference right the sensation belongs to the mind which is the subject and the form belongs to the object. Hmm?
both are impermanence. When the form changes, the sensation changes. And this is to be experienced in meditation on the breath. Hmm? The same form, the breath. When the sensation changes, sensation become more subtle, the breath becomes more subtle. Sensation is gross, the breath becomes gross. Hmm? Subject, object, interrelated. No subject without object, no object without subject. So one who does so on the feelings that are conjoined with the mindfulness, so we have explain all this we experience through the mindfulness on the in-breath and out-breath that apprehends the inhalation and exhalation engages with the aggregate of feeling so he understand the feeling or sensation may be better word here is that which receives the object either as pleasant or as unpleasant or as neither pleasant nor unpleasant when your mind becomes subtle, it becomes pleasant. If the mind is gross, it can become very unpleasant. <laughs> when you run up the mountain, the breath becomes very unpleasant. When you rest your mind and body, the breath becomes very pleasant because the mind is very subtle sensation becomes subtle and the breath becomes subtle dependent origination one who does so on through understanding engages with the aggregate of recognition hmm? The recognition means here uh, perception. Hmm? He translates as recognition because it consists of uh, 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 holding the sign of the object, hmm? grasping the sign of the object. That is perception. And we can say because we grasp the sign of the object, we receive the object. If we don't grasp the sign of the object, we don't receive the object. They are interrelated. So, uh, sensation is a, uh, closely related to perception. So they are most important parts of the mind process. They are called the formations of the mind. Because the mind differentiates in accordance with perception and sensation. So, the recognition because uh, when there is a sign of the object, the mental process can appear. If there is no sign of the object, what mental process will be there? Hmm? Now, very important meditation. When you don't grasp the sign of the object, where is the mind? Hmm? Please think about it.
when you take the sign of the object you can perceive the mind if you don't take sign of the object can you perceive the mind and to take the sign of the object you have to pay attention right and you have to investigate the object hmm? so then the mind will go to the object and start differentiating hmm? one who does so on understanding engages with the aggregate of recognition when one who does so on mindfulness, volition and wisdom engages with aggregate of mental formations. So aggregate of mental formations is there are two ways of understanding aggregate of mental formations. It's either will or all the other mental formations except the uh, sensation and recognition what he calls here perception hmm? actually recognition and sensation or perception and sensation they are also mental aggregates but Buddha teaches them separate because of their importance. They have the decisive role to play in the formation of the mind. So they become a separate aggregates, but they are also mental formations. This is clearly explained in Abhidharma Kosha. The uh, subject is mental formations. But these mental formations, they you can investigate them when you hold the sign of the object and you receive the object otherwise what will you differentiate very important to see one who does so on the mind the mental engagement and consciousness engages with the aggregate of consciousness. So the consciousness is that which differentiates all that. On the base of the worldly consciousness, on the base of sensations and perceptions. But how about the super mundane consciousness? one has to experience, to know. Those who engage with the aggregates and abide there many times are said to be thoroughly trained by engaging with the aggregates. So it means by engaging with the aggregates uh, thoroughly, you can actually also realize the path you can realize the uh, dependent origination, you can realize the uh, Four Noble Truths. Hmm? Why? Because the aggregates are the whole. And as the Buddha explains, only when you know the whole, only when you penetrate the whole, only when you 
detach from the home only when you abandon the home you can what means abandoning you cannot abandon the aggregate because you are, we are uh, our heart is also still alive hmm? so the mystery of the mind so when we know the whole is explained as when we know the uh, real characteristics of our experience hmm? the hardness being the earth the movement being the wind and so on hmm? the heat or coolness being the fire element the reception of the object being the uh, sensation hmm? holding the sign of the object being the perception hmm? going to the object and organizing the other mental formations being the will hmm? or the factors of the will and differentiating the object being the worldly consciousness hmm? so you get the whole when you get the whole you can penetrate it by contemplating its impermanence hmm? when you contemplate it in samadhi you receive the great the joy and happiness hmm? and you can realize the ultimate happiness hmm? the happiness of nirvana why you can penetrate the dependent origination hmm? that's what the buddha did what means dependent origination these causes and conditions they arise and cease at the same moment So this is very deep. One has to practice to penetrate. Hmm? When one has practice in this way, the mind will disengage from grasping. Hmm? When the mind will disengage from grasping, one is still here, but not in the real sense. Hmm? And this is emptiness. So the acquaintance with engaging with the aggregates become the wonderful method, the method of liberation. You, you cannot strictly separate it from all the other methods. So we should understand the meditation as a process in which actually these different parts of the process cannot be strictly separated they interflow and when we want to practice really in depth we should see this interflow not use the mechanical mind hmm? and we are all trained kind of with a mechanical mind due to mechanical mind we see the real subject and the real object hmm? but in reality there is no real subject no real object where can you find sensation without the form but the science tried desperately to separate sensation from the form now it does not do it anymore but do we get 
influenced by it? No, we still believe we are real and what we experience outside is very, very real. Hmm? So did it influence, lessen our grasping, hmm? our attachments and our anger? No, one has to experience, see by himself. Hmm? This is what the Buddha has taught. So through training by engaging with dependent origination, the dependent knowledge of dependent origination naturally flows from the knowledge of the five aggregates if we investigate them in the way described here. But now it's already nine o'clock and more, so let us go to the questions. What is a technique for placing? Hmm? We have now learned you cannot really disengage placing from following hmm? and from knowing the long and short breaths. They are a process. This is a if you just want the placing, it, <laughs> it is automatic thinking. Hmm? So first you know the breath is long or short. What you know as long and short is actually the concept of the breath, not the real breath. The real breath is not short, not, not long, hmm? because it disappears where it appears. No one can catch the wind. Hmm? No one can catch the movement. And the movement is actually, everything is in the movement. So what we catch is our concept of the movement. So because you pay attention to the long breath, short breath. Hmm? So, uh, automatically, when you do it with mindfulness, you can follow the long breath and the short breath. When you can follow the long breath and the short breath, then uh, your, you will be able to place the mind on the mental image, which becomes very clear. Hmm? At first, this mental image of the breath will be, uh, when you apply more concentration, then this uh, place where you apply the mind will become kind of connected with a certain visual appearances. At first they will be sporadic. When you continue not to, to engage with the long or short in breath and out breath and follow it from the beginning to the end with uh, uh, more and more mindfulness with more and more concentration. Mindfulness is linked to concentration. Then this uh, visual form will become 
brighter and more solid. Hmm? Then you learn to place the mind on that image hmm? and you can go into the state of uh, the samadhi. So, uh, in this meditation on the breath, then this uh, experience of the mental image of the breath will be, so to say, illumined by the mind. The mind can illumine the object. Hmm? Because this... Uh, press is the mental object. Hmm? Will you please explain again the method of following? <laughs> Well, I, we have explained that. Hmm? You cannot separate the following from the clear understanding of the long or short breath. When you clearly understand the long or short breath, you will follow the long or short breath from the beginning to the end. Hmm? When you can do that, you can place your mind on the mental image of the breath you have created in the mind. When you can do that, that image will become illumined. Hmm? So please try to avoid the automatic thinking. Hmm? This is why this text is so uh, instructive, because in a way it attempts to break our much better in a way than the explanations you find in the Southern Buddhism to break our very, very uh, rigid idea, automatic thinking. We train in uh, long and short breaths, then we train in uh, uh, following, then we train in placing, then we train in uh, 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 investigating. When we have trained in investigating, only then we can uh, turn away from impermanence. Hmm? O only then, when we have turned away from impermanence, then we can uh, attain the uh, uh, purity. Hmm? Actually, these things they are linked together. Who separates them? So, in a way, the Asanga is... Uh, Asanga himself is very well trained in all the Agamas, in all the Abhidharma, but he introduces this, connects them with the idea of the bodhisattva path of one reality in which the different parts cannot be strictly separated. And it is very useful, extremely useful for meditation. The mechanical thinking is the enemy of meditation. And the non-dualistic world to which the meditation actually should lead, no matter how we meditate in southern or northern tradition, is a wonderful world. And we live in our small world because of our mechanical thinking. In a way, this is more clear in uh, Northern Buddhism or in the Hindu tradition.
tradition. Hmm? This big Ganesh with such a belly and a voluminous body is riding on the mouse, a small mouse. Hmm? Where does it happen? In a non-dual world. Hmm? All the dimensions are different in emptiness. But we hold desperately to our mechanical thinking. So we are prevented from uh, seeing in a different way, seeing the whole. How does one use awareness to purify the mind? Oh, it's a very simple. Awareness means wisdom. And if we have awareness, we can see the defilements clearly. If we don't have awareness, we cannot see defilements. But we are in the middle of defilements. So due to awareness, we become aware of what? We become aware of the object, due to awareness, the object becomes clear because it is a wisdom which makes the object clear. That's why the wisdom is explained as light. Hmm? The symbol of wisdom is light even in our uh, Western civilization. Hmm? Every university has a lamp as a symbol. Hmm? The wisdom is light. What is the function of wisdom? What is the function of awareness? To illumine the object. Hmm? When the object is illumined, the mind becomes clear. When the mind becomes clear, it becomes aware of the defilements. If the mind is not clear, what is it aware of? only of one's own perversions. Hmm? It, uh, be being involved in the perversions, it uh, does not see the reality, does not uh, illumine the reality due to perversion, what is the opposite of wisdom? The ignorance. Hmm? And ignorance means perversion. So when our mind is perverted, it has, even so it has defilements, it, it does not see them. When we see the defilements, we can remove the defilements, when we don't see the defilements, how we can remove them? Similarly, when we experience the suffering, when we penetrate the suffering, we can penetrate the end of suffering. If we don't penetrate the suffering, how can we penetrate the end of suffering? When we penetrate the defilements, we also penetrate the uh, antidotes, how to deal with the defilements. Because we will see the causes of the defilements, how they arise, how they cease. Hmm? This is all this is awareness. So, due to awareness, we put things together with wisdom. When we put things together with wisdom, we remove ignorance. And when we remove ignorance, then the object remains always clear, and the mind has no defilements. What prevents us from seeing the nature of the mind? the non-clarity of the objects and the defilements.
during a walking meditation period, if we are too tired, can we do posture, corpse posture instead? Uh, sure, you can, <laughs> no problem. And now we are practicing individual walking meditation. Hmm. In the Zen tradition, they always walk together around the Manjushri, quick, then slow, then quick, then slow, hmm. but keeping always the awareness of walking. Hmm. The mind becomes empty. When the mind becomes empty, it is also purified. So this experience of the empty mind is very, very important. So uh, let us finish here. Now we have to do a bit of recitation as usual for a good sleep. We recite now the Dharani of the Great Compassion and, as usual, the uh, Heart Sutra. Yesterday we recited in Sanskrit, today we recite in English hmm? the Heart Sutra. Oh yes, I told you I am going to translate this Dharani of great compassion, so let us leave it for tomorrow. Hmm? So today we just recite. Namo Ratnatrayaya Namo Arya Avalo Kiteshwaraya Bodhi Sattvaya Maha Sattvaya Maha Mahakaru Nikaya Om Sarva Bayeshu Trana Karaya Tasmai Namas Kritya Imam Arya Avalo Kiteshwara Tava Nila Kanta Namu Ridayam Avartaishyami Sarva Arta Sadanam Shubam Ajayam Sarva Bhutanam Bhava Marga Vishudakam Om Tat Yatha, Aloke, Aloke, Loka, Mati, Atikrante, He, He, Hare, Maha, Bodhisattva, Smara, Smara, Ridaya, Kuru, Kuru, Karma, Sadhaya, Sadhaya, Dhuru, Dhuru, Vijayante, Maha, Vijayante, Dhara, Dhara, Dharendreshwara, Chala, Mala, Vimala, Amala, Mukti, Ehi, Ehi, Lokeshwara, Raga, Visham, Vinashaya, Dvesha, Visham, Vinashaya, Moha, Chala, Visham, Vinashaya, Hulu, Hulu, Mala, Hulu, Hulu, Mala, Bulu, Bare, Padma, Nabha, Sara, Sara, Siri, Siri, Suru, Suru, Bodhya, Bodhya, Budhaya, Budhaya, Maitreya, Nila, Kanta, Darshana, Prahradaya, Swaha, Mahasiddhaya, Swaha, Siddha, Yogeshwaraya, Swaha, Nila, Kantaya, Swaha, Padmahastaya, Swaha, Chakra, Yuktaya, Swaha, Shanka, Shubdane, Bodhanaya, Swaha, Vama, Disha, Stita, Krishna Jinaya, Swaha, Vyagra, Charma, Nivasanaya, Swaha, Namo Ratnatrayaya, Namo Arya, Avalo Kiteshwaraya, Om Siddhyantu, Mantra, Padhaya, Swaha. Now we recite the Heart Sutra in uh, 
English. The Heart of Pragya Paramita Sutra Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara while deeply immersed in Pragya Paramita clearly perceived the empty nature of the five skandhas and transcended all suffering Shariputra Form is not different from emptiness and emptiness is not different from form Form is emptiness, and emptiness is form. So it is with feeling, conceptions, mental formations, and consciousness. Shariputra, all dharmas are empty in character, neither arising nor ceasing, neither impure nor pure, neither increasing nor decreasing. Therefore, in emptiness there is no form, there is no feeling, conception, mental formations and consciousness. No eye, ear, nose, tongue, body and mind. No form, sound, smell, taste, touch and dharmas. No realm of vision and so forth. Up to no realm of mind consciousness no ignorance and no ending of ignorance and so forth up to no aging and death and no ending of aging and death there is no suffering no cause no extinction no path there is no wisdom and no attainment there is nothing to be attained by the way by way of pragya paramita the bodhisattva's mind is free from hindrances with no hindrances, there is no fear. Freed from all distortion and delusion, ultimate nirvana is reached. By way of Pragya Paramita, Buddhas of the past, present and future attain the supreme enlightenment. Therefore, Pragya Paramita is a great powerful mantra, the great enlightening mantra, the supreme and peerless mantra. It can remove all suffering. This is truth beyond all doubt. And the Pragya Paramita mantra is spoken thus. Gate, gate, para gate, para samgate, bodhisvaha. So now what remains is the transference of merit. I think we have it here also. Sukunta Eta vata chame hi sambhatam punya sampadam. Sabbe satta anumodantu sabasampati siddhya. Aka satta chabumatha deva naga mahidika punyangta anumoditwa chiramarakantu loka sasana. Aka satta chabumatha deva naga mahidika punyangta anumoditwa. 
आका सत्ता चबुमठा देवा नागा महिधिका पुण्यं तंगनुमोदित्वा चिरमाकांतु तुमं पना साधु 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 so another day now three days left please try your best to get the taste of what we are learning here hmm?